In lesson one, we looked at how to analyse the form and structure of poetry. In this lesson, we are going to look at the soundscape of poetry. The sounds of a poem are a crucial part of how the poet conveys meaning. How, you might ask, aren't poems written? How do they make sounds? It's true that these days we mostly read poetry, but it's important to understand that poetry is traditionally an oral form. This means that it's supposed to be read aloud. To begin our lessons on the soundscape of poetry, let's look at two big ideas, euphony and cacophony. Euphony is when words sound pleasant and harmonious, like in this line from Wordsworth. Beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Poets often use beautiful sounds in their poetry to reflect the beauty and harmony of what they're describing. In this example, Wordsworth's euphony helps convey the splendour of the flowers that he's looking at. The opposite of euphony is cacophony, which is when words sound harsh and unpleasant. Shakespeare gives a great example in Macbeth when the witches chant, Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. See how the words seem to hiss and spit? Poets use cacophony to convey the nastiness of what they're describing. In this case, the witches and their evil magic. So how does a poet make something sound nice or not? The rest of the lesson will go through some techniques that poets use to create euphonic and cacophonic effects. One of the most basic sound techniques is alliteration. This is when the same letter or sound is repeated. Whether alliteration makes the poem euphonic or cacophonic depends on the context. Let's contrast two lines from the poem Kubla Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Here's the first. Five miles meandering in a mazy motion, the sacred river ran. This is a great example of euphony. The alliteration repeating the M sound makes the description seem lyrical or song-like. The euphony thus adds to the beauty of the river. Let's explain this properly in a peel paragraph for practice. To find out more about how to construct a peel paragraph, check out English Basics Lesson 2 or revisit Perfecting Poetry Lesson 1. Our main point is that Coleridge's poem conveys the beauty of the river. As evidence, we would say, this is achieved through the euphonic effect of alliteration in meandering in a mazy motion. Then we'd offer our explanation of the evidence. The repetition of the M sound slows down the pace of the line, creating a dreamy tone. Finally, we would link back to the main point. Thus, Coleridge's euphonic use of alliteration helps capture the attractiveness of the river. Alliteration, however, doesn't always sound nice. Sometimes it's deliberately used to create a cacophonic effect, like in this line from the same poem. Chaffy grain beneath the thresher's flail. The alliteration of the F and TH has a cacophonic effect. It creates a harsh thrashing sound that perfectly describes the crash of the river against the caves. See, the effect of alliteration depends on its context. The repetition of some letters can create euphony, adding to the beauty or romance of the scene. The repetition of other sounds can create cacophony, which negatively portrays the subject of the poem. That's why there are words to describe specific types of alliteration. One of them is liquid alliteration which refers to the repetition of L sounds. Liquid alliteration is almost always euphonic. It's soft and gentle, like love 
lollipops and lemonade. Take the first four lines of Bright Star by John Keats. Bright star, would I were steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendour hung aloft the night and watching, with eternal lids apart, like nature's patient, sleepless eremite. Let's analyse it using another Peel paragraph. Keats' poem conveys the beauty of the star. Keats achieves this through the euphony of liquid alliteration. The repetition of the ul sound creates a gentle, lyrical quality that expresses the persona's amazement at the star. Thus, Keats' use of liquid alliteration helps capture the beauty of the bright star. Another specific type of alliteration is sibilance, which refers to the repetition of S sounds. While sibilance can be soft and gentle, it can also create a harsh hissing quality, making it cacophonic. Check out this example from T.S. Eliot's poem, Preludes. The winter evening settles down with smell of steaks in passageways. Six o'clock, the burnt-out ends of smoky days. And now a gusty shower wraps the grimy scraps of withered leaves about your feet. Again, let's use a peel paragraph to get our point across. Eliot's poem conveys the griminess of urban life. His use of sibilance captures his negative view of the urban experience, such as in his description of the smell of steaks in passageways. The sibilance creates a whispering hiss that evinces the poet's disdain towards the dirty urban scene he describes. Thus, Eliot's use of sibilance expresses his distaste for city life. In summary, alliteration comes in many shapes and sizes. Remember that certain types of alliteration, like liquid alliteration or sibilance, are more likely to create a specific effect. Always remember to explain how the repeated sound is euphonic or cacophonic and link that back to the poet's purpose in creating a pleasant or harsh sound. Let's now turn to another element of sound in poetry, rhyme. In our last lesson, we looked at how rhymes can add to the structure of a poem but rhymes can also create a pleasant song-like effect that adds to the beauty of what's described. Take this extract from a famous Shakespearean sonnet, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day, Sonnet 18. We've labelled each line to show the rhymes. The lines ending in A rhyme with each other, as do the lines ending in B. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Here, the rhyme creates a harmonious repetition of sounds at the end of each line. This lyrical quality makes it romantic and song-like, which is perfect for a sonnet that's all about expressing love. Rhymes can also create a link in meaning between the two rhyming words. Take this extract from Robert Frost's Fire and Ice. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favour fire. The way the poet rhymes desire and fire connects the two words. In this way, the rhyme helps us realise that desire is a burning passion that will make the world end in fire. Get it? Sometimes poets aren't just rhyming to make a poem sound pretty. Rhyme can also be about emphasising meaning, like in Frost's poem. When you're writing your essays, try to keep an eye out for how poets use rhyme to help convey their message. Next, let's look at onomatopoeia. This is when the word sounds like the sound it's describing, like 
bang and shh. Fancier examples include words like mutter, murmur and shriek. All these words sound just like the sound they're describing. Poets can use onomatopoeia to make the soundscape of the poem feel familiar and realistic. They want to evoke an experience you've already had. Take this line from D.H. Lawrence's poem, Piano. A child sitting under the piano in the boom of the tingling strings. See how the boom and tingle is so much more evocative than just saying someone was playing the piano. Lawrence actually describes the sounds of the instrument so we can imagine that we're there listening to the piano. Let's put that in a peel paragraph. Lawrence's poem captures a nostalgic childhood memory of music. This is achieved through the onomatopoeia describing the piano sounds. The words boom and tingling vividly recreate the sound of the childhood piano, suggesting he still remembers it clearly. The clarity of his memory, conveyed through onomatopoeia, therefore indicates the fondness of the persona's memory of his childhood piano. Nice. The last element of sound in poetry is rhythm. Rhythm in poetry is just like in music. It's the speed and flow of the poem. Sometimes, poets will keep their poems slow and restrained. This might be because they're trying to depict something soft and gentle, or maybe even boring. Other times, poets will hasten their rhythm to a galloping pace. This creates excitement and tension. Think of this example from the nursery rhyme, There was an old lady who swallowed a fly. There was an old lady who swallowed a spider who wiggled and jiggled and tickled inside her. See how the rushing pace of the second line creates a sense of wild movement, just like the spider's jiggling? Let's put that in a peel paragraph. The poet conveys the discomfort of the wriggling spider in the old lady's belly. This is achieved through the poem's fast rhythm. The galloping speed of the second line mimics the jiggling spider. Thus, the fast rhythm of the poem helps convey the motion of the spider inside her. Awesome! Let's recap. In this lesson, we've looked at alliteration, including liquid alliteration and sibilance, as well as rhyme, onomatopoeia and rhythm. When you mention these in your essays, don't just identify these techniques. Make sure you explain their effect too. Also, try to link your explanation of techniques with the poet's overall message. You can use the peel structure to help you do this. Now you're ready to have fun reading all kinds of poems. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons on Stage 4 English Essentials, check out our analysis of Powering Through Prose.